Hey, Shalom Shalom from your Dutch Uncle John, here to tell you what it is in Elijah, Elisha, part four. Long time coming. We haven't done part four. Okay, in the parts uh, you've already seen, one, two, and three, uh, we showed you that Elijah was a prophet, um, the Tishbite, and he precedes uh, his protege or follower, Elisha, okay? And we also learned that Elijah was a type of John the Baptist. And we showed you lots of evidence to this. Um, the Bible predicts that an Elijah will come. Uh, Jesus confirmed that John the Baptist was Elijah. Um, the Bible says that Elijah is going to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord, um, and which I do believe Elijah will come physically uh, during the tribulation period. Um, but he also came spiritually uh, preceding Yeshua, uh, Yeshua's arrival. And if Elijah precedes Elisha, then John the Baptist, in some parallel, should precede his follower. And his follower is, not follower as in following his, but one who follows physically, um, Yeshua. And if Elijah and John the Baptist are paralleled, then Elisha and Yeshua should be parallel. So that's what we're going to look at today, the parallels between Elisha and Yeshua. Uh, one of the things we talked about in the previous video was that Elisha and Yeshua have the same, kind of the same names, they're very similar. Um, Elisha is El, Elohim, saves, and Yeshua is Yah, y Yahweh, saves. So their names are very similar. Um, uh, I would say that Yeshua's name, uh, you know, Yeshua is Yah saves. Yah is the name of God. Uh, Elisha is El saves. El is just kind of the generic name of Elohim, a uh, God. Okay, it's not his name, it's his title. So Yeshua has a more perfect name, a higher name, I think, than, uh, than Elisha. Uh, another parallel is uh, they both leave their mother and father behind uh, to, to do their ministry. Um, Elisha just uh, went and he, remember, he killed his uh, oxen and fed the people and he burned all his uh, plows. Uh, to cook the meat and distribute the, the meat. Uh, and Yeshua, he left his uh, mother and father. Remember on the, uh, they went up to Jerusalem for Passover when he was 12 years old. And they couldn't find him. And he had gone back to talk to the doctors there in the temple. Um, uh, they forsook all to be disciples of their master. Okay. Uh, Elisha followed Elijah. Uh, Yeshua, he forsook all. He was seated in heaven, and he gave that up to come to earth to be our korbon, to be our blood sacrifice. You can watch all these in the first three. Here's Elijah, Elisha, uh, part three, thumbnail, look for that. And now let's continue uh, the new things. Uh, one of them, um, what we're going to start with is, let's go through the miracles of Elisha and see if they parallel uh, Yeshua's miracles. The first miracle that Elisha performed was, uh, after Elijah was taken up, Elisha went back to the Jordan River, and uh, we find this in 2 Kings 2, uh, verse 13 and 14. It says, he, Elisha, also took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and struck the waters and said, where is Yahweh, the Elohim of Eliyahu, Elijah? And when he also had struck the waters, they were divided here and there and Elisha crossed over. 
This is Elisha's first miracle. Okay? And we see a parallel to this in Matthew 3, starting in verse 16. It says, After being baptized, Yeshua came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So, we have a, a double uh, kind of a parallel here. Um, one, remember Elisha, uh, he asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And as we showed in previous videos, he did receive that double portion. Elijah, remember, performed eight miracles. Elisha performed 16. So that's kind of showing that he got the double portion and he got that double spirit that he asked for. And Yeshua, he also received the spirit uh, at the Jordan River there. Uh, remember, the, the dove came down and uh, alighted on him and the voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So they both received the spirit at the Jordan River and uh, maybe even a, dub, uh, a more bigger thing is um, Elisha parted the Jordan River, Yeshua parted heaven, right? It, it opened up and a dove came down. So uh, Ye Elisha did a big thing there, Yeshua did a bigger thing there, okay? And they both received the Spirit. Um, and at the Jordan there, they continued uh, their predecessor's ministry, right? Jesus follows uh, John the Baptist, and uh, Elisha follows Elijah. And their ministries begin at the Jordan River. So we have parallels there. Uh, in 2 Kings 2.15, uh, it says, Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho opposite him saw him, they said, The spirit of Eliyahu rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. And the parallel would be Mark 8, 27, starting. Now Yeshua and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist. But some say, Eliyahu, Elijah. And others said, uh, one of the prophets. So these two are both recognized as true prophets of God. Uh, Elisha's second miracle, where the uh, Jericho Springs were healed in 2 Kings 2.19. Then the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, now the situation of the city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad, and the land is unfruitful. He said, Bring me a new jar and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. He went out to the spring of water, and he threw salt in it and said, Thus says the Lord, I have purified these waters. There shall not be from there death or unfruitfulness any longer. So the waters have been purified to this day, according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. And the parallel, and before I continue, notice according to the word of Elisha. If you go back and look at Elijah, Elijah always is from the, the word of the Lord. Elijah is just repeating what the Lord tells him to repeat. Elisha doesn't ever quote the word of the Lord. Elisha speaks as if he were the Lord. He's not, but that's the parallel because Yeshua, he speaks as if he is the Lord and he is the Lord. So, there's the parallel there. Now, so what's the parallel with the uh, making the pure water for life? Uh, well, we see that in John 4, uh, starting in verse 7. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Yeshua Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, 
you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Yeshua answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So they both provided pure water for life. And I want to point out, because we always look at the numbers in things, if you read that story of Jesus at the well with the Samaritan woman, you'll notice that Jesus says seven sentences to the Samaritan woman. There's your seven again. Always, the, the sevens are hidden everywhere. I think we'll spend eternity picking out all the sevens. He'll be sh being shown all the sevens that are in there. So, uh, Elisha provides pure water. Jesus provides pure water for eternity. eternity. You understand? Jesus is a better Elisha. Um, the third miracle of Elisha is that the bears... Uh, destroy the mockers in 2 Kings 2:23. 2, uh, Elisha has now come out from the Jordan. He's crossed over and he went to Bethel. And while he was there, a group of children started mocking him. Uh, verse 23. Then he went up from there to Bethel, and as he was uh, going by, by the way, young lads come out from the city and mocked him and said to him, "Go up, you bald head! Go up, you bald head!" And when he looked behind him and saw, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two female bears came out of the woods and tore up 42 lads of their number. And he went from there to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. Wow, what parallel is there of that? Um, huh. Ah, in Matthew 21, 12, uh, this is where Jesus enters the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those selling doves. So, what's the parallel? They were both zealous in Beth El. Beth El is Beth House El, God, the house of God. And, you know, one of them is called Beth El, it's the city, and Jesus was literally in Beth El, the house of God. Um, Elisha's fourth miracle was water for kings. We find it in 2 Kings 3, 17. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you shall drink, both you and your cattle and your beasts. So Elisha stops the rain, yet the valley fills with water, and he provides the water. And Psalm 107, 35 says, He, referring to Yahweh, turns a wilderness into pools of water and dry land into water springs. And as we know, Yahweh and Yeshua are one in the same. Uh, Elisha's fifth miracle was multiplying the oil for the widow. In 2 Kings 4, 3 and 4, uh, then Elisha said, Go, borrow vessels at large for yourself from all your neighbors, even empty vessels, and do not get a few. And you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons, and pour out into all these vessels, and you shall set aside what is full. Ah, okay, so uh, Elisha multiplies oil for the widow, well, and in John 2, in the Brit Hadashah New Testament, uh, verse 6 starting. Now six stone water jars had been set there for the Jewish rites of purification. Each could hold from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the water, fill the jars with water so that they filled them to the brim. Now draw some out, he said, and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that, he had, that had been turned into wine. He did not wor know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside, and everyone said, Everyone serves the fine wine first, 
and then the cheap wine after the guests are drunk. But you have saved the fine wine until now. So, one of them multiplies oil. Oil represents spirit. One of them represents, uh, multiplies wine, which represents joy. And uh, I do want to point out when it says that each could hold 20 to 30 gallons, that's not what the Bible says. It says each could hold from two to three metrote. That's the Greek word that's used, okay? And in the King James Version, it's translated as two or three firkins. Um, I'm guessing the equivalent is 20 to 30 gallons. All right. Um, all right. So they both multiplied liquid. Uh, and I do like always to point out that there were six stone water jars at this wedding of Cana in the book of John. Uh, six represents the number of man. Remember, man was created on day six, right? And uh, this having there being six empty stone cold water pots, that represents the condition of man at the time. We were empty, stone, cold, and Yeshua filled them with joy living water and turned it into wine joy uh, very nice picture there remember every number in the bible represents something okay elisha's sixth miracle was the gift of a son in 2 kings 4 we see uh, then elisha said at this season next year you will embrace a son and she said no my lord O oh, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. And then the woman conceived and bore a son at that season the next year, as Elisha had said to her. This was the Shunammite woman, um, and he promised her a son, and she got a son. And where is the uh, Shunammite woman? Where is she from? She's from Shunem. And where is Shunem? Well, you can see here, I have the map of Nazareth, and just south of Nazareth, uh, in the red box, we'll enlarge it, and you see um, there's the red box, and there's a Mount Moray, and just on the south side of this mountain is the village of Shunem. Uh, it looks very close, like about 10 miles away from Afula. If you've been to Israel and ridden buses, if you want to go from Jerusalem or Tel Aviv up to the north, you're going to change buses in Afula, or at least stop there. Okay? Um, and we have lots of promised sons uh, in the Bible. Genesis 17, 21, uh, Yahweh promises Abraham, but my covenant will I establish with Yitzhak, which Sarah will, will bear unto you uh, this, at this time uh, next year. In Luke 1, 13, but the angel said to him, Zacharias, uh, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Uh, this is John the Baptist's birth, right? His mother was uh, uh, Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary, Yeshua's uh, mother. And remember, Elizabeth, what does Elizabeth mean? Well, it starts with L, L, God, and then it's uh, E, that's Yod, that's my, my God, um, uh, or God is my, uh, and then Shabbat, Sabbath, Zabbat, Zabeth, okay, so, and S Sabbath means rest, so God is my rest, Eli Shabbat. Uh, Luke 1.30, then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and you shall call his name Yeshua. Uh, the English is always Jesus, but it wasn't Jesus, it was Yeshua. Learn his name. Okay. Um, now, uh, in 2 Kings 4, 27, there's a couple of verses past, uh, it says, when she reached the man of God, this is the Shunammite woman now, okay, 
she was given a son, and now it's a little bit later on. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she clung to his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away, but the man of God said, Leave her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said, Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? Didn't I say, Do not deceive me? What had happened here is that son that she was given died. And now she's upset and she's run to the man of God, Elisha, to complain. Okay? And they refer to him as the man of God in verse 27. In fact, they refer to him as that twice in that verse. I have it here in the Hebrew, and it's the Hebrew is Ish Ha Elohim. Ish is man. The he is the, and then Elohim, the man of God. Now, look at the Hebrew, because the, he's got a secret thing hidden in here. I know you like these things. If you start in that verse 28, I have a, an aleph in the first, second, third, fourth word. There's an aleph and it's underlined. And then I'm going to go backwards. One, two, three, four letters and I get a yod, and go back four letters, I get a shin, and four letters, I get an aleph, and four letters, a lamed, and then a hey, and then a yod, and then a mem. It spells out man of God, every four letters in the Hebrew, which is kind of clever because he mentions the man of God. That's what the verses are talking about, and he's got it hidden in there uh, in the same verse where it's, in daylight there twice. Very nice. Okay, so we got this dead boy, this dead Shunammite woman's boy, or it's a Shunammite woman's dead boy. Uh, and in 2 Kings 4.35, it says, When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying on his bed. So Elisha went in, closed the door behind the two of them, and prayed to Yahweh. When Elisha got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eye to eye, and hand to hand, as he stretched himself out over him, the boy's body became warm. Then he returned and walked in the house once back and forth and went up and stretched himself on him. And the lad sneezed seven times and the lad opened his eyes. So we have Elisha raising a son from the dead. Parallel? There are more than one, but here, Luke 7, 14, and he, Jesus, Yeshua, came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Yeshua gave him back to his mother. So, they both raised a woman's son from the dead. All right. Um, look in Luke 7. We have, uh, this is not really a miracle here, but in Luke 7, starting in verse 11, it says, Soon after, uh, Jesus went up to the city of Nain. Now, he, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, uh, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, Do not go on weeping. And then again in John 19, Now beside the cross of Yeshua stood his mother. So when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. So there is a parallel here, and that is that Elisha showed pity to the widow who had lost her son, and he raised her son. And we see Yeshua also has pity on uh, widows here, and that's just another parallel that's not really a miracle, just a parallel, okay? And we are taught in the uh, 
Torah, Exodus 22, 22, you shall not oppress any widow or orphan. Deuteronomy 27, 19, cursed is one who distorts the justice due to a stranger, an orphan, or a widow. And all the people shall say, Amen. Uh, in Mark 12, verse 38, in his teaching, Yeshua also said, Watch out for the scribes. They like to walk around in long robes to receive greetings in the marketplaces and to have the chiefs seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They defraud widows of their houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will receive greater condemnation. These are the Pharisees. These are the, these are the Democrats. And I'm sure there's some Republicans thrown in there, and I'm sure there's some independents. But the Democrats in the United States are the biggest Pharisee hypocrites ever. Ever! But I digress. All right. Today, Lubimi Cherry. This is... Up there with uh, pomegranate is my favorite. Love it. Okay, so we see that they both cared for widows. Um, we also see in Acts chapter 20, remember when Paul, this is now Yeshua has died, raised, gone back up to heaven, and Paul is out preaching. And uh, it, he was preaching one night, and a certain young man uh, named Eutychus, seated in the window, was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. Maybe like a lot of you do during my videos. <laughs> I hope not. Uh, when he was sound asleep, he fell from the third story and was picked up dead. But Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and embraced him. Do not be alarmed, he said. He is still alive. Then Paul went back upstairs, broke bread and ate. And after speaking until daybreak, he departed. And the people were greatly relieved to take the boy home alive. So we have uh, Paul also having um, pity on somebody and raising them from the dead. In fact, uh, there's, there's a lot of parallels between Paul and Elisha. Maybe we do a video on that someday. Paul, Elisha, and Yeshua. Um, we showed you Elisha's route. Um, uh, his ministry started there at Gilgal, um, which this is, that's the first camp in the Promised Land that the Jews, when they crossed the river in Gilgal, and Joshua circumcised the next generation. Uh, the circumcision is a separation from your old life, now it's the new life. And then Elisha went to Bethel, uh, which is the house of God, where Jacob's ladder was, right? That's the house of God. So Elisha separated, then he went to seek the presence of God. Then he went to uh, Jericho. Uh, Jericho is where the Jews fought their first battle, uh, or God fought their first battle. The Jews walked around the city seven times, seven days. And... Uh, he won the battle by a walk of faith. And then uh, the Jordan River, and uh, this is where, this is the, that represents the, uh, the death, burial, baptism is the death, burial, and resurrection, right? You die, you're buried, you come back up out of the water. Um, uh, and Alicia crossed over the Jordan River here. All of these places parallel big things that Yeshua did, and they, were, they parallel what Paul's route was. Okay, maybe not his physical route, but if you read the scripture in Philippians 3, starting in verse 7, Paul says, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. So he separated from his old life. Verse 8, more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And in verse 8, more than that, 
I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. So he's seeking the presence of God. And then in verse 9, he continues, And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, faith in Messiah, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So there is a walk by faith that Paul has. And then verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may at attain to the resurrection from the dead. So there's a picture of the baptism, death, and resurrection. So Paul is paralleling Elisha's route. Just threw that one in for free. Okay, uh, Elisha's eighth miracle was healing the stew. Um, and this you will find in 2 Kings 4, verse 41. But he said, now bring meal. He threw it into the pot and said, pour it out for the people that they may eat. Then there was no harm in the pot. Remember they had made a big pot of something and somebody had gone out and picked some wild something and threw it into the pot and it was poisonous and it was causing people to be sick from this mushroom or whatever they put in there that was bad. And uh, he healed that uh, pot of stew. Elisha did. Um... Okay, uh, in 2 Kings 4.42, it says, Now a man came from Baal Shalashah and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And he said, Give them to the people that they may eat. His attendant said, What? Will I set this before a hundred men? But he said, Give them to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. So he said it before them, and they ate and had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. So he feeds a hundred people with twenty loaves of barley bread, Elisha does. Okay? Well, the parallel is John 6, starting in verse 8. One of Yeshua's disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are these for so many people? Yeshua said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. Yeshua then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated. Likewise, also of the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, so that nothing will be lost. When they were filled, um, uh, verse 13, So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves, uh, which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Nice. Uh, notice there were barley loaves. Okay. Uh, also, um, they sat down in hundreds and fifties. Nice. Okay. So we have a large crowd which were seated on grass, it made a point to say on both of those, in groups of 50 and 100. He fed the people bread, made from barley, with food left over. There's one, two, three, four, five, six parallels in one little story. And I don't think it's a coincidence that there were 12 baskets left over. Yeshua, you know, has 12 apostles. And I think he was also teaching them, give, give, and God will provide for you. That's how we are to live. 
You know, if you have two cloaks and somebody needs your cloak, give them your cloak. God will provide. All right. Uh, let's jump to 2 Kings chapter 5. This is a long story. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to just give you the highlight verses. Um, we have a guy named Naaman the Syrian. He goes to Elisha for healing his leprosy. In verse 10, Elisha tells Naaman uh, to dip seven times in the Jordan. Naaman dips seven times in the Jordan and is healed. Naaman offers gifts to Elisha, and despite his urging, Elisha refuses the gifts. And Elisha says, go in peace. And Naaman then travels a short distance. All right, so now you know the backstory. Let's see what happens. In 2 Kings 5.10, Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. That is a miracle, okay? And the parallel is Luke 5, chapter, uh, verse 12. And it happened when Yeshua was in a certain city that, behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Yeshua, and he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him. So they both have cured leprosy. And let me just point out, only three people in the Bible cure leprosy. One of them is Moses. Remember his, his uh, in Numbers 12, starting in verse 1, then Miriam, that's Moses' sister, and Aaron, Moses' brother, uh, then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And when the cloud uh, had withdrawn from above the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, as white as snow. As Aaron turned toward Miriam, behold, she was leprous. Okay, so Moses sister gets leprosy and it does cure okay but you know what you want to hear something funny kind of in a sick twisted way <laughs> Miriam spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married um, you know what a Cushite woman is it's a woman from Cush and what is Cush Cush is uh, Ethiopia, uh, Sudan area. So what do we know about the people from Ethiopia and Sudan? They are black people. And she is getting on Moses' case because he's married a black woman. And so what happens? She turns white. Miriam turns white. That my friends, is funny. <laughs> Love it. So, I have no problem, and nor should we. I mean, love is love. If, if two people are in love, man and woman, it doesn't matter their race, okay? Be equally yoked in the Lord. That's the important part. Okay, there's a little side joke there. Okay, so Moses was one of the three who cured leprosy. And the other two are the ones who follow Elijah, Eliyahu. Well, one of them is Elisha. He physically follows Elijah. And we saw that he uh, cured Naaman by having him dip seven times in the Jordan. And the other one is Yeshua HaMashiach. He spiritually follows Elijah because Elijah, remember, is John the Baptist, if you will accept it. And who follows John the Baptist is Yeshua. And those two uh, are the other two who have cured leprosy in the Bible. Very nice. All right. Um, and uh, 
You know, Jesus, Yeshua himself draws some parallels at the beginning of his ministry when he compares his own prophetic role to that of Elisha. In Luke 4, 24, uh, it says, Then he added, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But I tell you truthfully that there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the sky was shut for three and a half years and great famine swept over the land. Yet, Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to the widow of Zarephath in Sidon. And there were many with leprosy in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. You know, this verse 25 and 26, 27, that's showing or giving evidence to verse 24. A prophet is not accepted in his hometown. They didn't accept Yeshua in Israel, so he goes and to the widow of Zarephath up in Sidon. Sidon is up in, in Lebanon area. And he went to help her. And 27, uh, he's not healing leprosy on anybody in Israel. He's healing leprosy to Naaman the Syrian, a foreigner. This is letting me know that the gospel is not dedicated only to the Jews. It's worldwide. Everybody can accept. Beautiful, beautiful picture. But here we see Yeshua is referring uh, to Naaman the Syrian. Okay? So we have Elisha and Yeshua both healed leprosy and Moshe, Moshi, Moses. Okay? Musa in Arabic. Um, 11th, the 11th miracle of Elisha is, remember, uh, we told you that, uh, Elisha told, uh, Naaman to go dip seven times in the Jordan River, and then he's healed, and Naaman wants to give him gifts, and Elisha says no, and go. Okay, then in verse 20 of 2 Kings 5, it says, Elisha's servant, I'm not going to read it, I'm going to just paraphrase. Elisha's servant, Gehazi, we met him earlier, remember? He was trying to chase the, uh, the woman away who lost her son. Uh, Gehazi runs after Naaman to get something from him. And then he lies to Naaman that Elisha has sent him to accept gifts. And so he receives these gifts. Uh, and Gehazi takes the gifts and stores them in his house house. Later, Elisha asks Gehazi, where have you been? Gehazi says, nowhere. And Elisha questions Gehazi deeper. Elisha has suspicion that Gehazi was up to no good, and he realizes that he went after Naaman and got the payment that was offered and that Elisha had rejected. So Elisha curses Gehazi with the leprosy of Naaman. Wow. Okay, so there's uh, uh, the eleventh uh, miracle of Elisha, um, and uh, in Luke twenty-two forty-seven, it says, while Yeshua was still speaking, a crowd arrived, led by the man called Judas, one of the twelve. He approached Yeshua to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas. Are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Okay, what's the parallel between those two? Both were betrayed by friends for the love of money. Gehazi went after Naaman to get the money. And Gehazi is the servant, friend, protege of Elisha. And Judas was the friend of protege, apostle of Yeshua, okay? And they were both betrayed for love of money. Um, the 12th miracle of Elisha, uh, 2 Kings 6, starting in verse 5, but, uh, 
a bunch of men are out working near the Jordan, uh, but as one was filling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said, Alas, my master, for it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. He said, Take it up for yourself. So he put out his hand and took it. Okay, the guy is out working with an axe. Axe head flies off, sinks in the river. He complains because this was a borrowed axe head. And what am I going to do? And the man of God, Elisha, threw a stick in the water and the axe head floats. Okay, and we have uh, a parallel to that, Matthew 14, 29 in the Brit Hadashah. And Yeshua said, Come. And Peter, having descended from the boat, walked upon the water and came to Jesus. So we have both Elisha and Yeshua defying gravity. One causing an axe head to float, one walking on water. Okay, Elisha's 13th miracle was giving sight to the blind. Um... In 2 Kings 6, verse 15, Now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and had gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots were circling the city. And his servant said to Elisha, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So Elisha answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Yahweh, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Remember, this story was uh, one of the kings. Uh, Elisha was causing, causing all kind of trouble for uh, the Israelites and one of the kings, not the Israelites, one of the kings there. And the king uh, sent his army, go bring me Elisha. And all these chariots and horses, they surrounded the tent where Elisha and his servant was. And the servant goes out and sees they're surrounded. And Elisha prays to God, open my servant's eyes to show that the ones with us are greater than uh, against us. And when he went out, he saw chariots of fire and, and full of horses uh, of the angels that Yahweh had sent uh, to guard Elisha and his servant. Beautiful picture, okay? Um, so he gave sight to the blind because his servant could not see the angels and the chariots of fire and the horses, okay? But he was given spiritual sight. He, he, spiritually, spiritual blindness was, was taken away. And in the New Testament, Mark 8, 27, Yeshua went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he questions his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he continued questioning them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, You are the Messiah. And he warned them not to tell no one about him. Nice picture. They received spiritual sight because they recognized Yeshua as the Messiah, as the Christ. Remember, Christ Messiah, Greek, Hebrew, same word, Mashiach, Messiah, Christ, anointed one, all the same. Um, in 2 Kings 6, this is uh, Elisha's 14th miracle. Um, all those armies that the king had sent to surround them, when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to Yahweh and said, Strike this people with blindness, I pray. So he struck them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. Miracle 14, striking blindness. 
Um, then Elisha said to them in 19, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he brought them to Samaria. Who were they seeking? They were seeking Elisha. And Elisha blinds them and then says, Hey guys, follow me and I'll take you to where the guy is you're looking for. They not realizing that Elisha was the guy they were looking for and he was right there. Um, and in Ephesians 4, in the New Testament, this is Paul's letter to Ephesus, verse 8, um, 7 and 8, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Messiah's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive the captives, and he gave gifts to people. So here, Yeshua, uh, Yeshua Yahweh, okay, Paul here is quoting Psalm 68, verse 18. You have ascended on high, have led captives away. You have received gifts from men, even from the rebellious, that Yahweh Elohim may dwell there. So we have Elisha and Yahweh, Yahweh is Yeshua, they led captives. Nice picture. Uh, okay, Elisha's 15th miracle. Um, now all these captives that he led back to Samaria, okay, what's he gonna do with them? In verse 20 of 2 Kings 6, when they had come into Samaria, Elisha said, O Yahweh, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So Yahweh opened their eyes and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And in Mark 10, verse 51 starting, and answering him, Yeshua said, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Yeshua said, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. So we have Elisha and Yeshua both gave sight to the blind. Elisha restored the sight with Yahweh's help and the prayer to Yahweh of the entire army that had come to get him. Okay? And uh, Yeshua rest restored literal physical sight also to the blind man. He did it more than once. Okay. Um, and in 2 Kings 6.20, but let's, we just read that one, right? He, he prayed and their sight was restored. And in verse 21, then the king of Israel, when he saw them, said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? He answered, Elisha answered, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them, and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. And the marauding bands of Aramaeans did not come again into the land of Israel. Nice picture. You see that? Elisha, he had the opportunity to kill every one of those that he had blinded, but instead he set bread and water and they prepared a feast for them and he restored their sight and he fed them and sent them back to their home country. This is love your enemies. And what did it say? They never came again into the land of Israel. Why would they attack again? Why would they attack these people who fed them and did not kill them? Nice, nice picture. And in the New Testament, Luke 5, 29. Then Levi hosted a great banquet for Yeshua at his house. 
A large crowd of tax collectors was there, along with others who were eating with them. But the Pharisees and their scribes complained to Yeshua's disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? So, we have Elisha and we have Yeshua eating with sinners. Yes, tax collectors. <laughs> Okay, and we have them both showing mercy, um, not harming them, they, they're eating with them. What a nice, nice picture, okay? Um, and we saw that with Elisha, they set bread and water before them, and in the New Testament, Matthew 5, 44, uh, Yeshua says, But I say to you, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. And we have that parallel. They both showed and taught love toward their enemy. Okay, so then Elisha dies. All right, well, we have a parallel there. Jesus dies. All right. Um, in 2 Kings 13, 20, and Elisha died and was buried. Now the Moabite raiders used to come into the land every spring. Uh, 2 Kings 2, verse 9 when they had crossed over, Eliyahu, Elijah, said to Elisha, Ask me what I should do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Here's a reminder. Elijah did eight miracles. Here are the, the references. You can look them up. And Elisha did 15 miracles. And he asked for a double portion. Notice, one of them did eight, one of them did 15, almost a double portion. Remember? Missed it by that much. Elisha dies. And then Elisha, uh, in verse 21 of 2 Kings 13, it says, Once, as the Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb, and when he touched the bones of Elisha, the man was revived and stood up on his feet. So now we have Elisha's 16th miracle, and that miracle is the miracle after death. A man comes to life touching Elisha's bones. Elisha's 16th miracle happened when Elisha was dead, but the point is he has 16 miracles. Elijah had eight. Elisha did double, twice as much. He did receive a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Beautiful picture. And the parallel is that um, Elisha's death, or Elisha's death, brought resurrection for others, and Yeshua's death and resurrection brought resurrection for others. The entire world right? He became our core bone, our sin sacrifice. And let me remind you, Jesus could not and did not sin. If he is going to be our perfect, innocent, willing sacrifice, he has to be innocent, perfect, and willing. If Jesus would have sinned once, it would have disqualified him to be our sacrifice. You understand? His death would have been for his own sin, the punishment for his own sin. But Yeshua had no sin. So that's why his sacrifice can cover us. Just want to point that out for those keeping score at home. Okay, John eleven twenty five. 25. Uh, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even if he dies. Lovely picture. Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Nice, nice picture. Um, here, I, I've made a little chart of all the miracles and all the little parallels that I could think of uh, between Elisha and Yeshua, and it's just a little concise 
gathering of them. Nice. You can stop and look at that at your own leisure. Hey, also look in, look in this is not one of his miracles, but it, look in 2 Kings 3.11. Uh, but Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the, and one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Okay, so we have Elisha, who used to pour water on the hands of his master. All right. Is there a parallel here? Well, yeah. In John 13, 3, uh, Yeshua rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the feet of his disciples and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So we have Yeshua poured water on the feet of his servants. I think this is a parallel, and a beautiful parallel. One, you can, you can understand pouring water on the hands of your master, that's your job. But Yeshua, God, washing the feet of your servant, that's a humbling, humility sign. What a beautiful, beautiful picture there. And a nice parallel with Elisha. All right, my friends. That concludes the long-awaited uh, Elisha, Elisha, Parallels, Part 4. To God be the honor. To God be the glory. To God be the praise. And we will see you here soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye. Wait! We have a bonus. Okay, I want you to look at some of these parallels. Uh, we already said they have similar names. Um, and I do think that uh, Yeshua's name is superior to Elisha's name because one is Yah saves versus Elohim saves. Um, we showed that they had both um, left their mother and father right, and gave up things. In 1 Kings 19, uh, it says, Elisha left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my mother and father, and then I will follow you. And he said to them, Go back again, for what have I done to you? Okay, so Elisha leaves his mother and father, abandons everything to follow his master, Elijah. And in Philippians 2, starting in verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, Messiah Yeshua who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So, they both forsook all to be a disciple of their master. Only, Elisha gave up his worldly things and left his worldly mother and father. Yeshua gave up his heavenly throne and his position as the son of God, as God. Okay, So Yeshua's parallel is greater than Elisha's. And you're going to see that all through these parallels. Right? It only makes sense. Yeshua is the better Elisha. Yeshua is the more perfect Moses. Yeshua is the, the greater Abraham. Yeshua is the second Adam. The pure, good, innocent, perfect Adam. Yeshua is going to beat everybody in everything. Um... In 2 Kings 2.13, uh, Elisha took up the mantle of Elijah the, uh, that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle uh, and struck the waters and said, Where is Yahweh, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the waters, they were divided here and there, and Elijah crossed over. 
In Matthew 3, 16, after being baptized, Yeshua came up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him, and a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Okay? One of them parted the river. One of them parted heaven. You see, one is greater than the other, but they are still parallel. Remember the Shunammite woman, right, who had uh, was promised a son, and then the son died, okay? And uh, Elijah goes and raises that son. Look, by the way, where this was. I told you earlier, it's in Shunem. And where was Shunem? It's on the south side of Mount Moray, close there to Afula, uh, modern-day Afula. Um, and in Luke 7, we have Yeshua raising a, a, a woman's son. In verse 11, soon after, Yeshua went to the city of Nain. Now, as he approached the gate, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd uh, from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, Do not go on weeping. Where is Nain? It turns out it's on the north side of Mount Moray. So not only did they both raise a, dead, a woman's dead son, they did it at the same place, on, on the base of this Mount Moray. How cool is that? Here's some other maps of it just to show you. There's the mountain. Notice one's on the north, one's on the south. And you know what? This should ring bell with the people of Israel. Because everybody in Israel knew that Elisha had raised a woman's dead son right there at Mount Moray. And now it's years later, and all the Jews know about Elisha's big raising of the dead miracle at Mount Moray. And now Yeshua raises a woman's dead son at Mount Moray. The people of the Israelites, the Jews, should have recognized hey, there is a parallel between Yeshua and Elisha. And then, once they establish that parallel, they can back it up. Elisha's predecessor was Elijah. Jesus' predecessor was John the Baptist. There is a parallel there. And that lets you know that Elijah is John the Baptist. He has to come before the Messiah. And the raising of the dead, remember, Elisha, he had to lay on the boy, hand on hand, mouth on mouth, eye on eye, right? Everything, not Jesus. Jesus just spoke, and he raised. Jesus' miracle is greater than Elisha's. Um, now, something happens that's pretty significant. Um, I'm going to read it from Mark 6. Verse 21, this is the beheading of John the Baptist. And verse 21, Then an opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers, and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced, and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Verse 25, Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king set an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Remember, John the Baptist was speaking out against these extramarital affairs and stuff that the king and his wife and people were doing, and 
And so they didn't like that. So uh, John the Baptist is now dead. Okay, so, wow, that's a huge thing. This, remember, John the Baptist parallels who? Elijah. So when Elijah is taken up, Elijah, his ministry is over. And now who takes over? Elisha. And now John the Baptist had a ministry, but he just got beheaded. And when he's beheaded, who takes over? His successor, Yeshua. His ministry is now the core. You got it? There's a nice parallel here. Um, and you're going to see something really cool here that shows you that Yeshua Jesus' ministry has now begun. 2 Kings 4, 42. Remember the Elisha fed the 100 people with five loaves of bread? Okay. Here it is in 2 Kings 4, 42. Uh, there's 100 men. And uh, Yeshua had them sit down in hundreds and fifties. Okay. So we, I showed you all the parallels just of the feeding. Right. Notice. At a large crowd, Elisha had 100, Yeshua had 5,000 men plus women and children. Elisha had 20 loaves, Yeshua had 5 loaves. You see the picture? Yeshua, he fed more with less. And this is a very important miracle. I hope you realize that. This is one of the miracles, maybe the only one, that is in all no, it's not the only one. It's in all four Gospels. You know, if I was picking, okay, what is the biggest miracle? What, what's it? I give a thing maybe, uh, I don't know, the, the raising of Lazarus. Raise, that's, that was huge. Huge, huge. But no, it only shows up in one, in John. There's so many incredible, incredible miracles, but this one, the feeding of the multitudes, shows up in all four. So this is a huge miracle. It's letting you know that the bread from heaven is provided to everyone. Okay? So, they both fed large crowds. Yeshua fed bigger crowds with less. Um, we showed you the, the miracle of the uh, healing of Naaman in 2 Kings 5. I won't read that all again, but you remember that miracle. All right, um, and uh, when he ended, he told uh, he told Naaman, "I don't want your gifts." Two Kings five nineteen, Elisha says, "Go in peace." In Luke seventeen, while Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered one of the villages, he was met by ten lepers, and they stood at a distance, and raised their voices, shouting, Yeshua, Master, have mercy on us. And when Yeshua saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they were on their way, they were cleansed. One of them saw that he was healed. He came back, praising God in a loud voice. He fell face down at Yeshua's feet in thanksgiving to him. He, he was a Samaritan. And Jesus said, we're not all cleansed? Where then are the other nine? Was no one found except this foreigner to return and give glory to God? Then Yeshua said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Look at the parallels in the healing of the leprosy. They were both done in the north. They both healed lepers. Although Elisha healed one, Yeshua healed ten. Again, he's the greater Elisha. They were both foreigners. Naaman was Syrian and Yeshua uh, healed Samaritans. Um, they were both instructed to do something. One was instructed to go dip seven times in, in the river, and the other one was instructed to go show themselves to the priest. And 
They each had one who returned in gratitude. Naaman came back and offered gifts to Elisha. And here we have one of the lepers came back to Yeshua. And they were both sent away in peace. Go in peace and go back. He said, uh, um, excuse me. Then he said, go, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So they were both sent away. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six parallels just in the healing of the leprosy. And there's probably more. Okay. In 2 Kings 6, we had the axe head falling in the water. And then the stick was thrown in by Elisha and the axe head floated. And in Matthew 14, 29, and Yeshua said, Come. And Peter, having descended from the boat, walked upon the water and came to Yeshua. So they both defied gravity. Although one is greater than the other. One is walking on, gra on the water and bringing uh, somebody with him. Okay? Now, I pointed out John the Baptist being beheaded. And that that is kind of a major sea change with what's happening. John the Baptist's ministry is done. Yeshua's ministry has begun. Okay? Uh, immediately she came in with haste and said to the king, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Who is John the Baptist? He's Elijah, spiritually. And who follows Elijah? Elisha. And who parallels Elisha? Yeshua HaMashiach. Right? Okay. Notice in Mark 6, after the beheading, that's when Jesus' ministry really begins, Jesus feeds 5,000. Got it? And, reminder, he instructed them all to be seated on the grass, right, in groups of 50 and 100. Okay? So, the Messiah's ministry begins, and Yeshua feeds 5,000. And look, this is in the same chapter, Mark 6, verse 25, John the Baptist is done. Mark 6, 44, just later in the same chapter, Jesus is feeding 5,000 who are seated in the grass. And then Yeshua steals the waters, right? Verse 51, in the same chapter of Mark 6, then he went up into the boat to them and the, the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure, and they marveled. What do we see here? What do we know about the Messiah? One of the cool things in the Messiah we learn is Psalm 23. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. That's what we're seeing here, my friends. John the Baptist's ministry is done. Yeshua's ministry, the Messiah's ministry has begun. And he makes them down, lie down in green pastures, sit down in green pastures, and then... He leads them beside still waters. He has Peter come out into the water off the boat and walk with him. It's showing that he is the Messiah. 2 Kings 13, 20. Uh, we showed you Elijah died and, and uh, he was buried. And then the Moabite uh, raiders were coming in. And they had quickly buried somebody and threw them into Elisha's tomb. And the dead man stood up. And what is the miracle? Resurrection from the dead for others. Wow! And what is Yeshua's last miracle? He dies. They crucify him. He, they bury him. He raises from the dead. And his death, burial, and resurrection brings eternal life to us, those who believe in him. How beautiful is that? John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even if he dies. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see how beautiful those parallels are. Resurrection from the dead for those, for, resurrection from the dead. That's beautiful, eternal life from their death, burial, and resurrection. Ah, oh, okay. So, we saw the parallels. Elijah precedes Elisha. John the Baptist precedes Yeshua. 
Elijah and John the Baptist are parallel. Elisha and Yeshua are parallel. Yeshua is the greater Elisha. He's the better Elisha. But you see the typology in these characters. All right, there's your bonus. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.